Good afternoon, and welcome to the National Press Club. My name is Teresa Warner, and I am the 105th president of the National Press Club. We are the world's leading professional organization for journalists committed to our profession's future through our programming with events such as these while fostering a free press worldwide. For more information about the National Press Club, please visit our website at www.press.org. To donate to our programs offered to the public through our National Press Club Journalism Institute, please visit press.org institute. On behalf of our members worldwide, I'd like to welcome our speaker and those of you attending today's event. Our head table includes guests of our speaker, as well as working journalists who are club members. And if you hear applause in our audience, we'd note that members of the general public are attending. So it is not necessarily evidence of a lack of journalistic objectivity. <laughs> I'd also like to welcome our C-SPAN and our public radio audiences. Our luncheons are also featured on our member-produced weekly podcast from the National Press Club, available on iTunes. You can also follow the action on Twitter using hashtag NPCLunch. After our guest speech concludes, we'll have a question and answer segment, and I will ask as many questions as time permits. Now it's time to introduce our head table guest, and I'd ask each of you here to stand up briefly as your name is announced. From your right, Rob Doherty, U.S. General Manager for, for Reuters. <laughs> Carrie O'Reilly, Editor-at-Large and Washington Daybook Columnist for Bloomberg News. Brig Owens, Redskins defensive back and holder of the Redskins record for most yards returned after interceptions and a guest of our speaker. <laughs> Pat Fogarty, Associated Press and Redskins season ticket holder. <laughs> Larry Brown, three-time all-pro Redskins running back and a guest of our speaker. <laughs> Angela Greiling King, Bloomberg News and Vice President of the National Press Club. I'm going to skip our speaker for just a moment. Ken Delecki, freelance writer and editor and member of the Speakers Committee who helped arrange today's luncheon. Mike Bragg, a Redskin punter who did not miss a game in 12 seasons that included a Super Bowl appearance and a guest of our speaker. Megan Poinsky, Deputy Metro Editor at the Washington Times and a new member of the National Press Club. <laughs> Rex Stuckey, Head of Stuckey Custom Photography and a two decades long Redskins season ticket holder. <laughs> Today, we are just two days away from the start of the Redskins 2012-2013 football season. On Sunday, the Washington Redskins will start their road to the Super Bowl, or not, against the New Orleans Saints after a preseason record of three wins and one loss. Some of you in this room remember the glory days when the Skins were regular playoff contenders and Super Bowl champions. You're the ones with the gray hair or no hair at all. <laughs> I'm only kidding. I remember those times, vaguely. Let's see, I was in the third grade. <laughs> Since their founding in 1932, the Redskins have won five NFL championships, including three Super Bowls. But since 1992, the team has only made three postseason appearances and had only four seasons in which wins outnumbered losses. But hope springs eternal, and the Redskins retain a strong, if somewhat diminished, fan base. The franchise owned by Mr. Daniel Snyder is thought to be the NFL's second most valuable, trailing only the Dallas Cowboys. This season will once again start with high hopes under the team's fourth first-round quarterback draftee since 1991, the 2011 Heisman Trophy winner Robert Griffith III, better known as RG3. He'll be playing with a much-revised <laughs> roster of players. Our speaker today is entering his fourth season as general manager of the Redskins. Bruce Allen started his football management career with the Oakland Raiders in 1995. While in Oakland, he won the George Young Executive of the Year Award. 
He joined the Tampa Bay Buccaneers as its general manager in 2004 and was hired by Snyder in December of 2009. Mr. Allen is a graduate of Langley High School in McLean, Virginia and set a punting record while at the University of Richmond. In 1978, he was drafted by the then Baltimore Colts. His father also had something to do with football. He was, of course, George Allen, the Hall of Fame head coach who led the Redskins to thrilling postseason games in the 1970s, including an unsuccessful appearance against the undefeated Miami Dolphins in Super Bowl VII. His brother George is a former governor and senator from Virginia and currently Virginia's GOP Senate candidate. And like many professional teams, Mr. Allen and the Redskins face challenges off the field as well as on the field. Early this year, the team was fined $36 million in salary cap space for alleged contract violations in the 2010 season. Backup safety Tenard Jackson has been suspended for violating the NFL's substance abuse policy. Popular players such as tight end Chris Cooley, running back Tim Hightower, and wide receiver Anthony Armstrong have been cut. And Redskins fans have become increasingly critical of the high cost of attending a home game in what many consider a less than stellar stadium. Hopefully, Mr. Allen will address some of these issues and give us his take on the Redskins prospect for the coming season. Please join me in a warm National Press Club welcome for Washington Redskins General Manager, Bruce Allen. Well, that's a different introduction. I'm not used to that. <laughs> but now that we got these conventions over for both parties, it's football season and they bring a football guy to the National Press Club. So this is a unique situation. Brig, Larry, and Mike, thank you for joining me. I'm sure you guys come here every Friday for talk about issues around the globe and things like that. But it is an exciting time for us in Washington and to our fans across the country. We do understand that we haven't been very successful of, of recent day. However, we're proud of our history. This is the 80th, history, 80th season for the Washington Redskins, and we've been celebrating our anniversary season this entire off season. We've made 21 tour stops across Maryland, DC, and Virginia, bringing our great alumni back to the regions for, for our great fans who have supported us over the decades. And with the current regime with the Washington Redskins, we really believe that our job is to carry the torch for the great players, coaches, and fans that came before us. Because we understand that you aren't a season ticket holder based on what we did last year. You're a season ticket holder for what these great players and their fellow teammates have done for the years before us. And that's our job today. Clearly, we made a, a bold, dramatic move in making a trade for a quarterback. And this quarterback, you're going to love. If you haven't met him yet, when you see him, you're going to love him. And I'm not talking about the player. I'm talking about the person. Because it's easy to see. <laughs> it's easy to see why he won a Heisman Trophy. He has fantastic skills and talents. But the man is the type of person we want to lead our franchise, not just for the 2012 season, but for the decade that we're approaching. It is an exciting time. We did have an issue with the commissioner regarding $36 million. But the team we're playing this week has a bigger issue with the commissioner who suspended their coach and a few other people. So I think we're going to have a very tough week down there. I know the, the Saint fans are going to be riled up. I'm sure Bourbon Street probably started today while I'm here at the National Press Club. Bourbon Street's probably having their own little uh, pep rally down there getting ready for the Washington Redskins. But the, when you think of our history, we still think we own the South because the Redskins were the only Southern team in the NFL for a number of years. And whenever we travel to the South, we have as many Redskin fans down there than we do uh, in a lot of other spots. Uh, we played in Carolina a year ago, 50% of the stadium was Washington Redskin fans. Jacksonville, 50% were Redskin fans. And it's our goal to keep them inspired and fired up for the coming season. And I promise you one thing about the team. And I know one of the questions will be, what's our record going to be? I have no clue. I have no clue what it'll be. But we will play 60 minutes of football 
every game. Because the players not only play for the fans and the organization, they play for each other. And that's the great thing in sports. It's not unique to our franchise. The great thing in sports is the camaraderie and the responsibility you feel to your teammate. And we're really proud of this group of men that we have in our locker room right now. And I think you're going to enjoy watching this team. So thank you for having me. Welcome to football season. And I can't wait to hear these questions. <laughs> thank you. You've been around football a long time. How badly do you think players have been affected by head injuries? Well, the, football, there are injuries in football. There's injuries in uh, baseball, basketball, NASCAR, and everything. The great thing that's happened over the time, you know, is the invention, the technology that we have nothing to do with inventing. Paul Brown invented the face mask because he wanted the players to look handsome like Larry and Brig and knew that you needed something to protect it. And every year, technology comes out with something better, and we adapt to it. The first rib protectors were these big, fluffy, down jacket type things the guys would wear. They barely could move their arm. Now they're wearing body-fitted Kevlar to, in order to protect them. So as, as technology improves, and the NFL is doing a great job working with the Defense Department on their uh, new inventions uh, will always be able to protect the players better and better and better. What's your take on college football today? Should we give up the fiction that a players are students and give them a salary? <laughs> uh, I, we'll let college football determine what's right. I do think these players uh, deserve something. Uh, they need it to get their education. We were talking about it earlier. If we can inspire them, uh, keep them around the coaches that recruit them, because the coaches in college just don't coach the player on how to run a certain play or a certain defense. They're their on-campus mentors, and I think the more time we allow players to spend with them will be better for those young men going forward. But as far as paying them, I think that would work for some programs. I don't know about all. How concerned are you about the unresolved referee situation? Shouldn't this get resolved before a call or non-call costs some team a game? Picking all the great subjects to get Bruce Allen fined with, obviously. Uh, <laughs> uh, I've had officials cost me games when I've had the regular officials. So let's not pretend that every game is, is flawless. I'm sure they're going to work it out. I don't know when. Uh, it's not going to affect this game this week, and that's what we've told the players. The only thing we have to be concerned about is Drew, B Drew Brees is throwing the ball, making sure we rush him, and, and make sure we don't turn the ball over. What do you think of the NFL having its first female referee? Will we see more women officials? The great thing about sports, and I know the NFL, it really is the perfect American uh, role model company. It's about opportunity and whoever is best. We don't care where you come from, who you are, if you can help us win. If a woman's more competent than a man, absolutely put her in there, because I do know some of the officials that could be replaced also. <laughs> Not naming any names, are you? No. Okay. Are there any rule changes you would like the NFL to make to improve how the game is played? Is instant replay being used properly? I'm glad we adopted instant replay when we did. It, you know, the audience and, and once again, technology and television has really improved the, the fan experience at home. And to ignore that would have been uh, not wise. And, and to help the events, to make sure there's not a mistake in the game that can be corrected, uh, it's, it's valuable. Is it being used? I'm not necessarily for limiting it to just three challenges. If a coach is right on all three challenges he makes, I, I believe he deserves another one. Your father inspired an over-the-hill gang to play to great football. Why does Coach Shanahan need so many greenhorns? Hello, over-the-hill gang that's at the table. 
You know, you guys were, as Mike said once, he said, if we were over the hill in 71, now what are we? You know, <laughs> think about that. <laughs> but uh, today's game and, the, and with the, the, the salary cap, it has become a, a younger player's game in, in term of tenure, except the person who's our, our number one leader on our football team happens to be London Fletcher, who has great experience. <laughs> and he would fit in with the Over the Hill Gang, the Hogs, or any team that in Redskin history. What are your expectations for this season with the recent cuts of Cooley and Hightower? Well, as I said, I'm not going to predict a, a record. Uh, Chris Cooley is a, a terrific Redskin, and, and soon will be recognized in the top 90 when that, that vote comes up. This year, we, we added 10 to make our 80 greatest Redskins. Uh, a special guy who, who will be a part of our organization. We made these decisions to cut down the team, which is a very, very difficult thing to do. When you talk about these young men, realize that from Pop Warner through high school and college, it's been their dream to play professional football. And when we take that away from them, it's a very humbling moment as well as a sad moment in their lives. So we make the decisions on what is best for the football team and, and hope for the best. Any chance that Chris Cooley can be re-signed? Yes, we've left the door open with Chris and, and we continue to have dialogue. And in fact, we're supposed to get together with him again next week just to talk about things, but absolutely the door is open. Has free agency destroyed fan loyalty as players jump from team to team? I, I, I believe it's, it's, it's changed a little bit, but it hasn't destroyed fan loyalty. Our, our, our fan base is, as, as you can see when you go to our games, it's, it's generational and we're proud. We were talking about the Green Bay Packers. There's free agency hasn't hurt their fan base and the traditional teams of the Bears and, and the Redskins, it, it, it won't change it. I think it's, it, it's good for the players. It's something that they wanted and it, it's helped them uh, find better places for them to uh, uh, play, play on a different team. In some places, you know, you might not fit a certain scheme and you need an opportunity to excel somewhere else because I, I wish the careers were a little bit longer than the four years average, but uh, it, if it can help them extend their career, that's good for them. How far did the signing of Donovan McNabb set back the efforts by you and Mike Shanahan to revive the team? Well, I don't, I don't think we were set back. I, I, I look at each year we, we, we approach it of what's available to the Washington Redskins. What's available to us in the fifth round of a draft? You, you make the best decision you can and you try and work with it. Uh, Donovan did not work out for him or for us. And uh, there was nothing personal involved. It just didn't work. But it was a decision that at the time, uh, given the, what was available to us, we would have made it again. I've had a lot of people ask me this question, so I think it's kind of the question of the day. How's the offensive line? Is it good enough to protect, protect RG3? We certainly hope so. And, <laughs> and, and the, Mike Shanahan's offense has always been known for being a successful running game. You know, John Elway got a lot of trophies and, and a lot of uh, uh, recognition for being a great player, which he was. But the running game in Denver was really would set him up to have uh, the time to throw the ball, uh, to keep the defenses off, off base at times. We think Robert has the, the, the weapons necessary on the outside and the inside to help us be successful. Players, fans, and media have been critical of the amount of authority NFL Commissioner Roger Goodall has exercised. Are those concerns valid or are you comfortable with the power he wields? You know, Commissioner Goodell has a, a, a difficult job. It's an important job, and it's a, a job that uh, holds a lot of power. But that's what we put into him. That's what the, the owners in the league uh, have granted him. That's what the players in the league have granted him. I understand that every decision he makes is not going to be popular with some people, uh, but that's the nature of the position. And 
you know, I think he does a very good job of, of trying to balance it as, as best he can. The Redskins have a lot of turnovers in coaches and quarterbacks compared with other teams. Would the team find more success if it stuck with some consistency in those positions? Consistency is a key, uh, but you got to have su success in order to have consistency. And as I said earlier, each year you look at how we're going to get better. And, and right now we, we feel we have the, the tools in order to be successful. The coaches and, and, and player changes of the past, I think our player changes is probably on par with most of the league. And right now, Coach Shanahan has, has got this team playing very well. As you've discussed in preseason, it looked like a different football team than you've seen the last couple of years. How did RG3's rating compare to previous year's top picks? And did the new rookie wage scale increase what you were willing to trade for the pick? Another good question. You know, what, when we looked at it and, it, and it almost goes back to the previous question, we knew there were two good quarterback prospects that we would have been happy with either one. Because you have to remember, when we made the trade in, in early March, uh, the Colts had not declared who they were going to take. So we're going to be comfortable with either player. We were looking for consistency at the position. You know, I'll give you a small little secret that we can't tell anyone. The, quarter, the quarterback position in the NFL is very important. Right? <laughs> and what we were looking for, and when we invested those two extra first round picks, was something that we were going to have some consistency at that position for the next decade. How do you react to Tom Boswell's piece saying that no team has had a winning record with a, with a rookie quarterback. Are you hoping he's wrong? I like Tom, and he is wrong. <laughs> uh, Mark Sanchez had a winning record his, his, his first year. Uh, I don't think you can look at, at what's happened in the past and, and make a prediction on what's going to happen today. Uh, every player on every team has a different environment. Every player has a, a, a different teammate next to him. And some running backs could come in their rookie year and run for 1,500 yards. But once again, that's probably thanks to their offensive line. And the defense is fearing the passing game. So we're going to make the best with our players, and, and we feel good about that. With games on Sundays, Mondays, Thursdays, and even some Saturdays, are you concerned with the oversaturation? I'm concerned for the players, uh, most importantly. It's, it's, it's a tough test, and we, we play in Dallas for Thanksgiving when you have to leave on a Wednesday after playing a game on a, on a Sunday. I, the fans are demanding it. We have the most popular sport in the world. Our TV ratings are better than the other four sports combined. Our, our fan appreciation, whether it's the Harris Poll or, or Associated Press Poll, we're more popular than three other sports leagues combined. And if we can give our fans what they want, I, I think that's what they deserve, and, it, and it's good for them. For the players, the, the tough thing of playing that short week, you get some extra time for your next opponent. So I think we've done a good job of balancing. Let's just keep Tuesday night to Tuesday night, though. <laughs> Do you think it's possible that NFL football will disappear from broadcast TV and go only on cable? No, I, I don't see that, and I can't tell you exactly the, the amount of years on our contracts. I, I don't see that happening. Uh, our sport really is a perfect product for television. With its, with its natural huddle breaks, it allows the commentators, it allows for replay, and, and this, this, I don't see that ever happening. Are there too many preseason games? Well, you know, it depends on what team you have, probably, how you would answer it. For us, no, seriously, we were a young team with a lot of new parts, and we needed that extra time to evaluate players and teach them the offense or the defense or the special teams that we're installing. So I feel comfortable with it. I remember my friends here, you played when there were seven preseason games and went to training camp for a lot longer than we do today. So I think as long as we mix in 
the, the rosters. We, we increased the roster limit to 90 players. And so you need those extra uh, practice games in order to get prepared. You're moving the training camp to Richmond, which apparently you played football there. Is there a connection there? And why are you deciding it to move it away from Ashburn, where the local fans can come, and to a, a further away distance for them to travel? Well, this franchise has, has generally always gone away for training camp. Uh, back in the, in the 40s and 50s, they trained at Occidental College in Los Angeles, and they would come back. Uh, in our years with the Redskins, with the Over the Hill Gang, we were in Carlisle, Pennsylvania, as was Coach Gibbs. We think Richmond is also our home fan base, and University of Richmond's finest punter, Mike Bragg, over here would attest to that. But we think it's a great way to reach out to our entire uh, territory. You know, part of our anniversary tour, we went down to the Naval Base, we went to Roanoke, Virginia, we went to Charlottesville. We think it's going to allow fans across the Commonwealth to be able to come and watch our practices at a, at a first-class facility. You were talking about the popularity of football, but why do you think football has not become as popular overseas as baseball and basketball, and where might it take root abroad? Well, I think that the, one of the commissioner's initiatives of playing this game in London is to educate fans about our game. And they're not playing it like we do in the United States of America. And once they see it and once they feel it, it does get a, a, a great response. I'm really more concerned about the New Orleans Saints, though, right now than if they're going to play in Australia next week. <laughs> What things are being done to upgrade the safety position? Any prospects on the waiver wire? Well, we, we keep looking at that waiver wire, and we, we've tried to make some additions. But really, the roster that we have right now is going to be our roster for the season. Barring, as I told you, some people are superstitious. Uh, barring injury, you don't want to have to replace anyone. We have eight rookies on our roster. We need them to practice every week in order to get better. And we'll always look and we'll always listen to trade possibilities. But right now, we're, we're going to go in with the guys we have. Are you superstitious? Do you have any rituals you do before games? <laughs> yes, a little superstitious. I don't know where I would have gotten that trait, right? <laughs> no, one, no one has that. You know, the, my biggest ritual here in Washington is on, on the way to FedEx Field, I drive by RFK and I, I salute RFK uh, when I go by it, take a picture and send it to the family uh, because there's obviously some great memories there. Well, with high hopes for a new season, maybe you need a new ritual to get you started. <laughs> Neil Rackers made over 84% of his field goal attempts last year and made over 80% in the last four seasons. Gano made 70% last year and Cundiff 75% and missed a routine field goal attempt last year to end the Ravens season. Why did Rackers get cut? Money or does in-camp competition trump every other factor? Well, if you brought Ozzie Newsom here, he could answer that question. He's the general manager of Baltimore, so I can't speak for why they cut him. We've respected him from afar, no different than every team in the league. You grade players and, 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 and evaluate them even though they're playing for a different team. Uh, we brought him in because we believe he, he's going to help us win this year. And he's got a very powerful leg, and, and we're looking for him to helping us win. Have the Redskins considered changing their name? No. You've worked for both Al Davis and Dan Snyder and Malcolm Glazer. Who is the most demanding? <laughs> you know, uh, I'm fortunate to have worked with those men. You know, Al Davis is, is different. He, he was an owner who was a football coach. He was an owner who was commissioner of the AFL. And he did, he did expect everyone to have the same commitment that he had. Malcolm Glazier is one of the world's greatest businessmen and, and really owns the most valuable sports franchise in the world in Manchester United. And his perspective of the game was a little bit different, but once again, it was based on success and being the top of the heap. With Dan, 
you have an energetic Redskin fan who grew up like all of our kids are going to Redskin games and cheering for their team. A tremendously successful businessman, one of the best in the world, whose drive and desire for us to win is, is magical and exciting to be around. They're all successful in their other lives because they're all successful people. So it's, it's a, a common trait of, of the people I've gotten to work with. How much autonomy do you really have and does he really influence your decisions? Oh, he's, he's really one of our, our biggest fans. You know, everything that we've said that we need in order to help our team, like this week we're practicing in an indoor bubble and blowing the speakers so they get used to the, the noise in the Superdome. Uh, when we said we would like to have an indoor facility, we started building, well, we started designing the next week and building as quickly as we could. He's, he's been very supportive of, of what we've done. So why hasn't it worked? We led the league last year in giveaways. The, the turnovers on the field were, were disastrous for us, and they, and they killed opportunities to win games. We got to, turn, we got to make sure we, we protect the ball better, create more turnovers, and play sound football. Uh, to blame an owner or a fan for that, I, I think would be stretching a little bit. When will the Redskins get a new world-class stadium, and where will it be? Well, we really like FedEx Field, by the way. And, you know, last year, it was a special year. We were talking beforehand. We hosted the Army-Navy game, which unbelievably was the first time the Army-Navy game has been played in the nation's capital. And, <laughs> and, and to see our stadium lit up, with the service people and, and the way it was decorated for that game, it is a proud venue for us. Uh, our attendance, our, I think the Washington Redskins have the top 10 attendance records in the NFL for a season, and they're all at FedEx Field. We will always look at ideas, but we are the Washington Redskins, and I am a little partial to, to being in D.C. The Washington Post took the team to task a couple years ago for the way it treated season ticket holders by suing them for breach of contract for not paying during the downturn. Has the team changed that practice? It's, it's difficult for me to talk about things that happened when I wasn't here because I don't have all the facts. Obviously, there were some disagreements and, and it got covered in the media. We love our fans. We work with our fans on, on an individual basis year-round, and, and at different times, uh, we've done see these great events to invite the fans to different forums where they can ask questions and, and, and feel more involved in the team. I don't think uh, what happened four, four years ago uh, you'll see happening in the future. Many fans are upset that your organization t continue to gouge its loyal season ticket holders with a stratospheric cost of simple food like hot dogs and popcorn. Why? <laughs> well, you know, glad you asked that question. I, I read this morning uh, a, a fan, they do a fan, fan cost index came out. And guess who charges the most? Those dirty, rotten cowboys. <laughs> but the cowboys had the highest. I, I think we were right around the average of the league in this, this new survey. So I, I think that our, our prices are right in line with everyone else. Are you concerned that the in-house viewing experience is keeping fans away from the stadiums? How are the Redskins improving the fan experience at FedEx Field? Well, the, t the TV is a, is, is a great place to watch a game. And I, I know that from watching college football. There's nothing like watching a game on a Saturday night uh, before one of our games on, on a beautiful high-definition uh, television. The in-game experience is created really by the fans and the team. We, could, we have beautiful new video boards. We have these new ribbon boards. I don't know if you've seen them that are fantastic and, and bring the stadium structure to life. But it's really incumbent on the players that are performing to make the fans cheer, to make the experience better, and clearly we have to win more games. Are you worried about maintaining the consistent sellout when they are tearing out 
seats and making room for standing room only? We're hoping that the standing room only in our remodeling that we've done, uh, we've changed uh, the energy uh, resources also. We put solar panels on. And our FedEx field now operates on the solar power year-round, everything except for game day, it can support it. Uh, the, in remodeling the stadium and doing the standing room only has actually been a very welcomed uh, approach from our fans. They've enjoyed the experience. And, and quite frankly, it, it, it's a fun environment. I walked through it last year during one of our games, and that group, it's a great way to watch a game with six people and be at the stadium because you're actually intermingling and not just uh, assigned a, a seat. So we think this is going to be a great experience. Obviously, the Cowboys have had good experience with it. Uh, Tampa Bay uh, has, has a great platform area for their fans during the game so they can walk around and, and watch the, still be able to watch the game. You talked about this, the solar panels and it powering FedEx Field and that you have plug-ins for electric vehicles at the stadium. So do you need a parking pass or do you just need a, a vehicle to plug in to get that front row parking space? Well, first of all, you, have, you better have an electric car if we give you that parking pass. But <laughs> those are assigned to people uh, who, are, who are, are ticket holders who have requested the, the, the power outage or the power source. Do you think the Redskins will ever face a problem with local TV blackouts? It's interesting because the blackout, no, the answer is no. Uh, the blackout rule really came into place because of the Washington Redskins in 1974. Uh, the games were sold out and they were blacked out locally. And, and President Nixon said, I have, I have a bit of an issue. I can't watch this team on television. And then Congress and the NFL got together it, and created the rules that we have today. So, no, the Redskins won't have that issue. Al Davis is one of the NFL's pioneers. What are some of your favorite memories or stories from being around him? Well, we won't tell those. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I loved Al and uh, I, I still honor his my time, my memories with him. He, he was a great competitor who had a great, great sense of, of the world. And he, he wasn't afraid to talk about anything that was happening in, in world conflicts to anybody. It, it could be you're at a, at a restaurant and the waiter would come up and say something and he'd say, I'm from here. And Al would get right into the conversations of trying to see which side of the the war he was on, but uh, a special man that I'll keep my memories to myself. You took over a club with a proud tradition, his, traditions and history of winning. However, in the recent history, that hasn't happened. What specifically do you do behind the scenes to begin to change that? Well, a lot of what we do is, isn't necessarily behind the scenes. Uh, we're trying to teach our players the history about this franchise. We, at Redskin Park, we put up our history wall that has all of these players that are here today along with uh, many others that tells about the greatness of the, of the Redskins history. We want to inspire them. It might sound corny, but we want them to appreciate who these people are and what they've done. And whenever our alumni are around and coming through our locker room or out on the practice field, you can see an extra pep in the step of our current players. So, uh, we understand our responsibility. I talked about it early. We, we have not done well enough for, for the Redskin history. It's our turn to try and create some positive history. What specifically do you do as a general manager? You don't appear to be ve very visible versus Mike Shanahan. Okay. Where's Mike at the National Press Club then? <laughs> uh, you know, the... The head coach of a football team is our general, and we're in the football season. He, he's the one who has to lead our men in, in, into competition each week, and, and every franchise has to rely on the head coach to be the face of the franchise during that time. Uh, we're all here to support our coaches and players. Everybody in our organization, we have 100 people at Redskin Park, we have over 100 people out at FedEx Field, Everybody's job 
is to support our players and our coaches in order to help them win. And if that's behind the scenes, if that means I have to pick up towels, I'll, I'll do that if it'll help us win. Your father used to get advice from President Nixon. Do you ever hear from President Obama? <laughs> I have not met the president, no. What do you think it would take to get him to your game? I don't, I don't know. I think he's going to be a little busy for the first half of our season. <laughs> <laughs> and then in the second half of the season, we'll, we'll extend the invitation again. He's, he's clearly always invited, and that's part of the tradition of Washington sports uh, with the president and, and the teams. For a long time, the Redskins were the biggest game in town. Now the Nationals are on fire. What's it going to be like at the beginning of the season, especially if the Nationals do make it into the postseason? Well, we're going to be excited for them. A lot of their players know our players, and, and it's, it is exciting what they've, what they've got going this season. And I don't want to be superstitious, but I don't want to uh, jinx them, but it, I, I think they have a chance to do very well in the postseason. And that's excitement. Uh, the, Making people have a good attitude in this area is a great thing. Uh, one thing I know about the Reds, because we could talk, we can't agree on a lot of things in the city when I read the newspapers, all right? We, can, we can't agree that Thursday follows Wednesday sometimes. But there's one thing, when the Redskins win, the city's alive, and they're happy, and I know that's going to make a more productive society. And when the Nationals win, it's going to lift the, the feeling and the spirit of this community. Are you sorry to see that Sam Huff's game coverage is being reduced? Well, I, it, you know, Sam, Sam is a friend and obviously a, a, a living legend. And at this time, it's the best thing for Sam uh, to not endure all the travel that uh, broadcasting the game entails. You have to remember that the hours involved in that are strenuous. We'll come home from some of the away games. It'll be 3 in the morning, and that's after waking up at, at 6 a.m. in the visiting city. So uh, Sam's still going to be with the Redskins, and, and we'll look forward to his home broadcast. Since you've been with the team for four years, what's the biggest challenge you've faced? It'll be this week in New Orleans <laughs> <laughs> against a very angry team. In two seasons, Mike Shanahan has fewer wins than Jim Zorn did. Zorn was fired. Is Shanahan coaching for his job this season? You know, the great thing in the NFL, in all of sports really, is, is we have a scoreboard. And you know instantly each week if you were successful or not, if you have to go back to the drawing board and come up with a new plan. We understand that there's pressure that comes with winning and losing, but that's why we loved it. It is the greatest natural drug in the world, going into a game with high anticipation and hoping for success, hoping that your, your, your work week was productive. Uh, Mike's not going to worry about that stuff because he's been in the NFL for 20-some years, so we don't worry about that stuff. Can you compare what it's like to work with John Gruden and Mike Shanahan? Uh, it's interesting. They have more similarities than you would think about when you first look at them. Obviously, John is a little bit more expressive in his face. <laughs> but they both are, had worked for Coach Bill Walsh. And they both had some of the same sound principles of how to build a team and how to install an offense. And I think both of them are great competitors. And, but I think the Bill Walsh uh, background is, is obvious to see in both of them. Could you comment on the recently released scientific report regarding the host of ailments which prematurely afflict retired football players, such as depression, skeletal degenerative diseases, and dementia? Well, I'm not, I'm not sure exactly what that one was, but I have seen results from the National Institute of Health that really our athletes are more healthy than everybody in the general society, which actually makes more sense. They're well-conditioned athletes, and if they continue to take care of themselves after their career days are over, they should be ahead of the general population because of their, of their previous training that they've done. Um, 
I'm proud of what the league is doing, and, and especially the commissioner, who we talked about earlier, of reaching back to our alumni, trying to do more and more for them in, in health benefits and making sure that we have all the education we need and make sure we get it to our alumni in, in, in providing them with the, the benefits that are available to them. Your dad kept the team in games by having players try to strip the ball from running backs to gain a turnover. It seems less emphasis is put on these specialties like this and the two-minute drill. The team for 20 years has struggled with this. Will we see a change? I surely hope so. Uh, <laughs> well, it, it, our coaches are working on stripping the ball. If you, it, this year at practices, uh, uh, there's been a, a great emphasis on it because, as I said earlier, our, our failure last year, our biggest failure that caused a, a losing season was our turnover ratio. We were dead last in the NFL, and that has to change. What do the Redskins do for the Washington community beyond what you do on the field? Well, I think we're a part of the fabric of this community. But one of the things that we have utilized is our Washington Redskins charitable organization. Uh, whether it's our Play 60 event that I know we went to over 3,500, uh, uh, saw 3,500 middle school students this year. Whether it's our Harvard Harvest Feast out at the stadium where we're fe feeding the underserved families of Prince George's County. Whether it's our reading program, which we've, we've distributed over 1.7 million books in the last five years to, to local schools and, and libraries. Uh, we're, we had 59 community events last year where we feel we've reached over 350,000 people in our neighborhood. And we like this role. When our players go somewhere, kids do listen. Families do understand when London Fletcher walks in and he gives a message, it is inspiring. So we, we relish our role in the community and, and look forward to doing more in the future. Well, being the general manager, I assume you oversee all aspects of the Redskins. Can the logo on the field look new for each game? <laughs> yes. Yes, I can do that. I can, I, I can do that. So it be said. <laughs> what position are you likely to have high on your draft list for next year? You know, the one thing I did learn from my father was the phrase, the future is now. So I'm not going to worry about our second opponent this year. I'm going to focus on today. Uh, you would never know what's going to be available. And we did a very good job the last few years of just following our draft board. Whoever the highest rated player when we're drafting is, that's probably who we're going to take. Other than, of course, Briggs, Larry, and Mike, who are your favorite all-time Redskin players? Wow, that's a, we don't have enough time to go through it. It's, it's a special bond. I, I, I got to be raised by a lot of these guys. They're older brothers to me, and, and the, the list is too long. But I will tell you, like Mike, Mike pointed out, and, and my dad used to say, he goes, you know, Bruce, you can learn some of their good habits too. <laughs> so learning from these big brothers always was an exciting time for a young teenager in Washington, D.C. Would the Redskins ever consider a stadium with a roof? Do real football teams play under a dome? Well, I'm not going to upset the New Orleans Saints before we play them. Uh, I, I, I think we're in a perfect climate here in Washington where you never really need a roof. We, our, our winters aren't that bad. Forget that one snowstorm a couple years ago that knocked power out for about a month. Uh, no, I think football, we have the perfect football environment. I understand why some northern teams need it, but uh, I think we, we're going to be fine in an outdoor stadium. Then why did you build a dome to practice in? <laughs> because it, it's not against the league rules, but we thought it was a bad idea to practice when there's lightning outside. And so it's really for when a lightning storm happens or the fields are so soggy that the player could get injured practicing that we needed the environment in order to still get our work done, to prepare for the upcoming opponent, 
and we will only use it in inclement weather or when we want to blow out everybody's eardrums getting ready for the New Orleans Saints. The Redskins, like many other teams, are plagued by drunk and unruly fans. How much is it the team's responsibility to control that? Well, we, we, we have done a very good job of upgrading our, our, our Twitter system and our email system for communications with our, our offices at FedEx Field during game day. No different than, than any part of society. The best people to let us know when there's an issue is our fans. And if some fan is being unruly, they are now able to text directly to our, our security office who can address the issue, and usually within 15, 20 minutes. What other lessons did you learn from your father that you incorporate today? And what of him do you reject in his uh, approach? Well, I, I, my dad had a great love of, for life and camaraderie and, and work. And I think uh, those traits, you know, the entire family is, is fortunate to have been raised with. I don't reject anything um, that my father or mom taught us. In fact, you know, we're very fortunate to have had those type of, of parents and very different types of personalities. But uh, uh, no, I liked every part of my, about my father. You've been around the game for a long time. What's your all-time favorite game? All-time favorite game. It, the, the, what, once again, that would be difficult to name. When we beat the Cowboys on New Year's Eve in Washington, D.C., and another example of what the Redskins mean to a community, there were zero crimes that night in Washington, D.C. That day had zero crimes, and Mayor Washington, I remember, coming out to thank the team for winning. Of course, we did it for the zero crime. That was never <laughs> anything, but uh, that's, a, that's the, the best game in Washington. Are you hopeful that Washington gets awarded a Super Bowl, and do you have any voice in pitching the league to bring the Super Bowl to DC? We have, we have begun some uh, preliminary conversations. You know, uh, the Washington Redskins, uh, about six or seven years ago, made a great proposal to the league. And I was with a, a different team, and we were one of the teams voting to have it in Washington. You know, this city has it all. When you talk about venues for hosting different types of functions of Super Bowl week, I remember seeing the video. That you could have your, your corporate hospitality cocktail party within the Capitol, or you could be at the Supreme Court. No one can match what Washington, D.C. can offer for a Super Bowl, and it, and it should be considered. You're at the National Press Club. Give us an assessment of the media coverage of the Redskins. You know, I, 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 I saw a quote from Tom Brokoff the other day, and they asked him, do you like where media is today versus where it was before uh, with the, the, the act uh, excessive coverage of every type of, of, of sporting event or political event. And he said he loved it. And I agree. You know, really, the biggest thing that's changed is our fans are also bloggers. Our fans are writers. We'll have more people reading one of our, our fans' blog in, in Florida than we'll read a, a, a newspaper at times. It's where you can find the information. And I, I think it's fair. It's about whether we win or lose. We get that, we understand that there is a scoreboard involved, and if you win, there are probably gonna be nicer articles, and if you lose, they're probably not gonna be so nice. Looking back at college football for a moment, conferences used to be fairly static. Now there's a lot of move movement. Is that good or bad? Uh, once again, I think college can answer that. You know, I've always been a fan of, of the bowl games in college football. Uh, I thought if you won the Liberty Bowl, that, that school felt very good about themselves. Maybe they weren't competing for a national championship, but they had a whole offseason feeling good for themselves. And when you had 30 bowls, that meant 30 programs felt good. And even the teams that lost, it allowed those players to stay around those coaches for some extra training and, and preparation. Uh, as far as where they're moving, I'm, I'm sure it's economically driven, but that's for them to decide. Do you think the NCAA does a good enough job in staying on top of recruiting violations? 
I really would have no clue. <laughs> I, 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 that's for the college people. If you could put together a fantasy Redskins team with any players from the league, who would you put on your team? Once again, trying to get Bruce Allen fined for tampering this time. <laughs> uh, we like players around the league, but we're not allowed to name names. Thank you. <laughs> Do you regret not having a pro football career of your own? No, I, you know, I, I don't know what I would change from my growing up. That I, I loved every part of it. Uh, the great thing about being around the players and coaches my whole life is they told me at an early stage, you're not good enough to play. <laughs> so it, it wasn't like it just dawned on me after my college days that I wasn't going to play. Before I get to the last question, I uh, have a few housekeeping matters I want to take care of. I want to let you know of the upcoming luncheon speakers we have on September 12th. Tony Perkins, president of the Family Research Council, will discuss the role of values in the November elections. On September 13th, James P. Hoffa, the president of International Brotherhood of Teamsters, will discuss defining patriotism, protecting America and the American worker. And on October 2nd, Arnie Duncan, Secretary of Education, will be here to speak. Secondly, I have a couple of uh, gifts to present to our speaker, Bruce Allen. I think we need to start a new tradition, and if you drink from the National Press Club coffee mug on game day, I think we could start a good winning tradition here. Thank you. And also for some uh, inspiration, this is a photo of the last playoff game at RFK Stadium. This was taken by our member Rex Stuckey, and I hope that this will inspire you to get us there again. Thank you. Thank you very much. And my last question, I have a couple of last questions for you. Do you give your brother George Allen political advice, and does he give you football advice? <laughs> uh, I don't really give him political advice. Uh, he does point out at times mistakes that we've made in the game. And, and, and I say, I, I was there, George. I saw that fumble. Uh, but he's really there as a as great support. He's, he's a great fan of the Redskins, obviously the same as me growing up here. And, and is looking forward to doing things. OK, last question, very important. By what score will the Redskins beat the Cowboys when they play this season? <laughs> we look forward to playing the Cowboys. The Cowboy Week in Washington is special. I, I, I love seeing the, the bumper stickers honk your horn if you hate the Cowboys. And, <laughs> and uh, we play the Saints this week, and that's where we're going to focus. Thank you. Thank you for coming today. I'd also like to thank the National Press Club staff, including its Journalism Institute and Broadcast Center, for organizing today's event. Finally, here's a reminder that you can find more information about the National Press Club on our website. Also, if you would like to get a copy of today's program, please check out our website at www.press.org. Thank you, and we're adjourned. <laughs>